I'm sorry. I'm, hello, Mark. Hello. Thank you for being with us. Happy um, to be here. Fantastic. What a what a reel. I mean, it. We left out a couple of stinkers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did. Which ones? I can't say. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it speaks for itself, but I want to just highlight a couple of things. You obviously span film and television. Um, movies like, groundbreaking movies like Speed, your work with Roland Emmerich, um, Saving Private Ryan, and now Steve Jobs, which is uh, headed, headed into the award season corridor. I hope so. Um, and then uh, television, shows that, that travel the world just so immensely, uh, Criminal Minds and Grey's Anatomy and now Quantico. Um, and you were a long time uh, based at, a, at, at ABC, and earlier this year sold part of the half the company to E1 to go the indie route. Um, and that sort of gives you the ability to finance other producers, and we call you, and, and your own shows, and we call you an advocate for producers. And right. I'd, I'd love it if you could explain what that, what, what you, how you how you would explain what that means. You know, it's nice. Uh, rarely do producers work with other producers. There are so many wonderful producers uh, that I admire. And so one of the opportunities is now to be able to work with some of these other people mm -hmm. whose work I've, I've always admired and, and love to, to try and find a way to work with them. So we have the opportunity to do that now. Um, I had an amazing time at ABC Studios. Mm -hmm and a number of shows on ABC Network as well. Um, they were so great to me, and frankly, I learned the television business from them. I had not really worked in television other than years before when I was making after-school specials in the, in the early 80s, right. uh, which were the first uh, television or movies that I produced. Right. So, um, so I learned an enormous amount at ABC the, the, the folks at E1 are incredible partners. Um, they have a, an area of expertise that I do not have. Mm -hmm. I have learned an enormous amount from them, even in this short period of time. What, what's the key difference for you working well, with them, do you think? Well, you know, they are terrific distributors. Um, and, and even though, as a studio producer at ABC, I was aware and engaged in the international distribution side of of our business, um, I'm much more involved now. Um, it's 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 not that it isn't and hasn't always been critical the international side, but my my focus has always been pretty much purely as a storyteller, creating things and and relying on the people at ABC or if it's in the movie business to um, to, to to really take the the best opportunity to exploit the product. I'm. I'm getting an opportunity now to learn from the folks at E1, and they're so good at it. And I wanted a partner that was really good at something that I, I was comfortable with, but certainly not, not an expert in. Okay. How do you see, in the television space, how do you see domestic tastes changing or evolving right now, and how does that translate to international? I think a lot of international buyers are frustrated with the lack of, of procedurals. Um, it's interesting because from an economic point of view, the domestic U.S. studios uh, do very, very well financially with procedurals, but the networks are less interested in them and seem to be less interested in them all the time. Unless it's CBS, you're not seeing a lot of procedurals on the network, a little bit on NBC, very little on ABC. Um, and I think that that's because they're not focused, the networks are not focused on the financial bottom line. Uh, certainly their, their, their sister company is. ABC Studios right. has done better business on Criminal Minds than possibly any other show they've had in quite some time, and yet you won't see a show like Criminal Minds on ABC. Um, the international community seems to be very interested in those kinds of shows. And one of the things that, that I'm here this week to talk about is how we're going to be able to create those shows for the, the marketplace and give them what they, what they need, which I love making. Right. So is there a way then to create those sorts of programs without having the U.S. that component? I think so. Um, you know, uh, years ago, um, I had a, a company called Mutual Film Company. 
And it, it, my, my then partner was very smart about bringing together, it was uh, the BBC, uh, Telemunchen, uh, uh, UGC in France, and Toho Toa in, in Japan. And the idea was that, that we would put up 60% of the budget, um, and sometimes we would uh, run these films through our sales company, and other times we would have a, a major distribute in the international territories. Um, I think that there is enough of a need now, and it's not that it's a new thing, but, but I think international buyers are coming together to try and figure out a way where not just with a, a, an MG, but with equity into the project, um, there's more uh, opportunity to, to create these shows. And frankly, we will find a way, whether it's on a broadcast network or otherwise, to, to get these shows on in the US. And you're now branching out into international. You're doing your first international co-production. I am. Thank you for reporting that this morning. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, um, we're doing can a... Can you talk a, about a, that a little bit? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting how development uh, occurs and, and what happens. When I first started working in television 11 years ago, I was told, well, if the show didn't work this year, put it in the trash. As a, as a coming from the film industry, we never put anything in the trash, we would wait. I have movies that I'm making now um, that I've been working on for 20 years, um, and now even television. So this uh, script uh, called Darkness Falls was, was originally developed uh, as a pilot for CBS. It's a terrific procedural in the vein of Criminal Minds, and it is a, about two FBI agents who go to small towns to deal with the most horrific crimes that exist in those small neighborhoods. Is it going to be set internationally? Is the it's idea... It's set in the U.S. Okay. It will be set in the United States. Um, and um, I met Kobe from um, ProSieben uh, in Berlin last, uh, last Berlin Film Festival, and we had dinner together and talked a little bit about what he was looking for. Um, I hope this will be the beginning of many co-productions for us, whether it's in the area of procedurals or whether it's in, you know, serialized programming as well. We're doing all different kinds of things, network, cable, smaller shows, bigger shows, um, but, but certainly on the international side, we're focused on finding the right kinds of procedurals for, for uh, the international territories. So is this part of a different approach that you're taking now under the E1 umbrella or in partnership with E1 in terms of how you're financing projects? You know, when you're a studio producer, there's very little that you concern yourself with financially other than the budget of your show and how much they're spending on marketing. Um, and what's interesting is that, that, and everybody has a different deal, but, but oftentimes you're able to take the money from your wins and not pay for your losses. Um, as an entrepreneur and in the deal with E1, and as it should be, the company will succeed or fail based on our wins and losses. So there's something different now because I'm focusing as much on, uh, on being bold and careful at the same time. And I think the, the interesting thing as a producer who really didn't have the responsibility financially of the failures is that, that I have to make sure that I'm not too cautious. Because if you're, if you're fear, fearful or cautious, I don't think that's the way to, to do your best work. So we're, we're looking at, at content and we're looking at the stories that we tell the same as we always have um, and hoping that the audience will continue to be there for them. How do you see producers in the States currently looking at the international market? We talked about how the networks are more interested in, in domestic and the networks aren't have it, not having the same focus as the studios. Right. But what about the, the different producers? Are they really considering international now as a, a major part of what they're, what they're putting forth? I think the biggest change in the last few years is that, that everyone is producing or trying to produce movies and television. For, for a long time, um, there was a real difference between, well, there's the movie producer and they only do movies and there's the television producer. That started changing I think about aggressively in the last five or six years, but I was fairly early in, in trying to do both because I found that there were stories that I wanted to tell and they were better for the smaller screen than, than for the big screen. 
Um, I think given the state of the business, particularly the movie industry, which is really tough right now, most producers are, are focusing on every opportunity they can to find financing for their projects. So they are looking into the international marketplace. And you have producers who, for the longest period of time, you know, didn't have a passport. You know, they were, they, they were focused so much on, on receiving from the studio when everybody had an overall deal and they paid for your staff and it was, it was great. Um, but the world doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so everyone's having to be scrappier. Everyone's having to look forward to say, where am I going to be able to tell my stories and how am I going to make a living? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just digesting that. Um, what kinds of shows beyond, because you obviously are a procedural expert, um, beyond that, what, what are you uh, excited about in terms of, in terms of dramas and, and shows that are, that are coming up? You know, um, the great thing about this partnership that we have with E1 is that because we're now a studio as opposed to just producers, we're seeing a lot more material. Right. And we always saw a lot of material, um, but we're seeing more because we're a, a buyer now right. and we're a financier as opposed to just producers. Um, it's really exciting. There is so much opportunity um, to tell great stories. And, you know, we've read over the last month or so that different people are saying that there's too much television. Yeah, what is your uh, take on that On that, I don't debate? think there's too much good television. And so, and so I think what, what we, we try to do, and I think everybody does, but you try to make great stuff. And you try to make things that you fall in love with, and you hope that there's an audience for that. And I've always taken the, the, the position that as opposed to looking into the marketplace or looking at the audience and saying, tell me what you want, because I don't think they know what they want. They want good. Um, I've always tried to, to explore the kinds of stories that got me, you know, whether they were, you know, a war film like Saving Private Ryan or whether it's a story like, uh, you know, Grey's Anatomy and those characters. In the end, it's all about great characters and great stories. And I don't think that there's enough of that on television. So I think, well, I think everybody also should... when you look, you know, we talked about this the other day, when you look at your reel, there, there's an awful lot of emotion that's kind of a, a, a through line. You know, some of us were crying when we I'm saw I'm a very it, emotional so. person. I don't know whether you knew that about me, Nancy, but uh, I'm very emotional. But, I mean, is that is that part of, you know, you I know, hate to pigeonhole and say editorial no, no, no. line, but... I, I don't... It wasn't by design. I think that, you know, we talk about a director's vision. We talked about looking at a, a movie director's body of work. And sometimes you can't really tell what that vision is until there is a body of work to look at. Mm -hmm. And so, so I look at some of the things that I've made over the years, and I can see a pattern, which is you say, I'd like to believe that there's real emotion and there's real humanity in the stories that I like to tell, but I can't tell you that, that it, it was by design. I think it's just who you are. I think that, that, that like many filmmakers, and, and we talk about this in terms of directors quite a bit, um, the magic that they have, the vision that they have, is not something that you learn in film school. It's who you are as a human being. And so the stories that interest me and I think that, that interest anyone who's making things, whether they're producers, directors, writers, are things that move them. And if they have the opportunity, as I have, and I'm very fortunate to have been able to make so many things, I can see a pattern, which is that there is an emotionality and a, and a humanism in the stories that I tell. But I don't think about it as I'm developing something. It's almost kind of by osmosis somehow. Right. It comes together, and then, like you say, you look... Right. You look back on it, right. and then it pops out at you. Um, what about the changing distribution models and you know different technology and all the different ways right. that there are to get? It's exciting. Out? I mean, it's exciting. But 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 there's a and I and I love telling the story. So forgive me. But um, some of you may know of the uh, uh, the uh, fashion store in it started in New York, uh, Barney's. Barney's. It was a men's store. And years ago, when I was a kid, I didn't grow up in New York, but I. I spent some time in New York. There was, this, there was this great commercial, 
and there would be different faces of young, young people. And it, you would hear an off-camera um, a voice ask, what do you want to be when you grow up, Susie? I want to be a doctor. What do you want to be when you, Billy? I want to be a fireman. I want to sell insurance like my dad. And then there was this kind of scruffy kid, and, and they said, and Barney, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he thinks about it for a minute, and he says, I don't know, but they're all going to need clothes. And, and, and for me, when people talk about the, the different pipelines for the content that we make, it's, it's a wonderful thing because it gives you the opportunity to tell different kinds of stories and have the work that you do reach more people. But, but, but I'm a storyteller, and fortunately, I like to think of myself as a plumber in that way, that, that someone's going to have to fix the pipes, some, someone's going to need some kind of a, a show that we make, and so whether it's you know on NBC, ABC, Hulu, Apple TV, uh, something on the internet that hasn't been invented yet, a good story is a good story. And I I'm, I'm, I'm feel lucky that that's the job that I have because they're all going to need clothes. <laughs> and things have evolved so much since you started in the business. I mean, do you see things going in a positive direction? Are there any negatives that you can think of right now? Um, things that we need to fix, things that are I, I, too challenging? I, I, I think we're in a very interesting place, and I don't quite know what, the, what I would necessarily say needs to be fixed. Um, I, think we have a, uh, I think we have to watch for a little while. Um, I think we're seeing the studio movie business as, as, as big tentpole films and, and the, the kinds of smaller films that... Uh, used to be made um, are being made either independently or frankly on television now. Um, I think that what's interesting is that for the most part, and this is completely true, but the, the best and the brightest, if you will, of writers that are writing for television are not the people that have these long-term overall deal with, with networks or studios. Um, so they, 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 wanna, they wanna do good work. And most of the writers, not all, but most of the writers that we find ourselves working with do not have a, 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 a deal, they're not encumbered by a deal with a major studio because there's so much opportunity and they don't want to tie themselves down. Traditional television is changing, but it's not changing so fast that we as a company are not going to be focusing very aggressively on network television. Um, as we are in cable and all the other opportunities as well. So there's still uh, great opportunities both creatively and financially uh, in the network television space. And how open are you to, to new talent, to receiving pitches and things like that from... We, we listen to everything from everyone. And, um, and I think one of the nice things about... Uh, look, I'm out of the demo. You know, I'm over 49 years old, so sometimes I question myself, don't tell. Um, sometimes I question myself about not so much the way to tell a story, but the subject matter. And, and things that interest me are not necessarily the things that interest the broad audience. However, we have a lot of executives in our company who are much younger than I am. And I don't need to love everything exactly the same. I just need to be able to see the possibilities. And we really look to our young executives um, and empower them enormously to be able to bring things into the company that they're passionate about and they're encouraged to fight for those things. So, you know, if a 26 year old or a 32 year old or a 40 year old has a different you know, di different life experience than I do, has, is coming culturally f from a different place. I want to know what they're interested in and what I hope that I can bring to that, aside from things that interest me as well, and I, I, not to say that, that we're not doing things that are specifically interesting to me, but, but I hope to be able to help those executives make the best version of their story, and that's, that's a real pleasure for me. Okay, can we talk a little bit about what projects you have going on currently? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Quantico, you know, just big we success. We have we have Did we have you? Quantico, which we're very excited about. And and I ask you a question about Priyanka Chopra, who's yes. a, a big Bollywood star. Yes. I mean, that's a real key 
international piece of casting. It, it is. That, and, and, it, I, and, and I know it, India was already going crazy about it before it came on. I have to tell you that, that, that having spent 11 years working with Shonda Rhimes, uh, when we started working together, she had never worked in television. She had never really been in an editing room. And it was a, a wonderful, humbling experience where, as we were making the pilot for Grey's Anatomy, by the time we finished, I was saying to her, now, how would you do this, as opposed to the other way around? And I had cut a lot of film, mostly movies. Um, one of the things that I learned from her was, don't put color or race or ethnicity or even the country that they come from in the script. So many times you'll read, this person is Asian, this person is black, this is a Jewish guy, wh whatever it is. Um, we don't do that in our scripts anymore. And, and with Quantico, uh, we weren't looking for an Indian actress mm -hmm. to play the lead in what seemed like an odd idea, actually, for someone who was a, a homegrown person who goes to work for the FBI to f try and find out about her American father. Mm -hmm. um, she just happened to be the best person for the job. Um, and over the years, I think both from Shonda and from ABC, who has really encouraged that diversity, um, I've learned an enormous amount, and, it, and I think it's, it's really paying off for ABC in a big way. Um, and certainly for us, sorry, um, um, she is magnificent. She is. And, and I would have to say, as, as strong as the show is, she really makes it. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we were smart enough, or lucky enough, depending upon the day, <laughs> to, to cast her in the lead of our show. Okay, and what about other upcoming stuff you can talk a little bit? We have uh, Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, right. which is also very international. Um, we did a, a, a spin-off of Criminal Minds a few years ago, which didn't work um, at all. I, I said to Nina Tassler, we should write a, a, a book on, on everything not to do when taking a very valuable franchise and trying to ruin it. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and we did just that. Um, I think we got it right this time. Um, the idea, and we've been working on different ideas over the past few years, is what happens to Americans when they are beyond our borders? Um, and so the show takes place all over the world. Um, the wonder of uh, digital technology and green screen and, and stock footage is quite amazing. Um, it really looks like we're in all these places. So you're not going to all those places. And we cannot afford to go to all these places, but, uh, but it looks like we have. Right. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not just Americans who have gotten into trouble, but it's Americans who have uh, also perpetrated crimes. Mm -hmm. And we read, certainly in the US, but I think internationally, we read about Americans in trouble all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I believe that, that on an international level, it will have the same kind of appeal that Criminal Minds does because it's, it's a version of the same show. We were, we were very, very fortunate uh, that Gary Sinise was ready to come back to work and he's at our center. We have a wonderful cast um, and, and I guess we'll see how the rest of the fall shows do on CBS, but we should be coming sometime after the first of the year. Fantastic, fantastic. And again, a global phenomenon. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, is there uh, any way to explain that? Why these, why these shows hit? I know it's just, you know, I some think kind that of people, alchemy. First of all, people like to be scared. People like true crime stories. Um, and I think that you can, you don't have to work as hard watching a procedural as you do on a, on a um, serialized show. You don't have to worry, did I, did, I, did I miss last week, or I don't remember that thing, and what happened between these two characters. Now, by the way, that's not to say that some of the best television isn't highly serialized. Right. Um, and I love making serialized yeah. shows. But I think that, that, that there's something that people feel. Uh, I was talking to someone last night about um, coming home and, you know, kicking off their shoes and watching a, a great yarn for... 42 minutes and 30 seconds, <laughs> plus commercials, um, and know that they can watch it, fortunately for us, every day of the year. Right. <laughs> and, and in the U.S., it seems to be on 24 hours a day, at least according to my father, um, who's, who's watching 
watching it a few hours a day, but um, I just think it's, it's, it's a simple, easy way, and I think that, that there's also a play-along factor. Who did it? You know, we've, we've, we've been fascinated by that forever, and, you know, certainly Agatha Christie with, mis with her mysteries have been something that we've all enjoyed over the years, so I just think it's fun. Um, and we happen to, I don't want to say get lucky, but, but, but I'll say get lucky. You know, we made a good show and people liked it, and that's a, that's a fortunate thing. I think that's a perfect place to, to wrap up. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you, everyone, for being Thank here. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>